Greetings everyone, it's Jeremy Sutton from PrecisionPrinciple.com on day 17 of the intensive Ashtanga yoga training. Now we've been talking about uh, physiology and anatomy over the last couple days, and so we'll go into that briefly, recap what we talked about, but today I'd also like to focus on talking about the distinctions between some of the different types of yoga, and in particular how this course uh, kind of sizes up against other courses. And so, first off, you'll remember yesterday that we were talking about bones and the joints, the different kind of common injuries. We talked about the most common injuries tend to be with the joints, uh, spraining tendons, inflammation of the tendons, that's tendinitis, uh, these sort of joint pains. And joint pains are the bad pain. Pains in the bulk of the muscle, these are the more beneficial pains, the pains that indicate stretching and growth. And Yesterday, we really started, to diving in, we started diving into all of the different joints in particular, and we talked about the different types of movements, how there are different divisions of the body, the uh, sagittal plane, the coronal plane. The point is that the body is broken up into different planes. There's one that goes down the middle, and there's a lot of technical vocabulary for you know, a, a, a medial movement or a lateral movement, which is a fancy way of saying moving your joints to the inside or away from the inside, different types of hip twists. So instead of getting too deep into the vocabulary of the classes yesterday, instead, let's suffice it to say that regardless of what our condition is, there are asanas, postures, that can benefit us in uh, combating our different types of joint problems. In particular, some of the more common uh, joint problems especially occur in the back. So for example, in the lower region of the back, the lumbar spine, when this part of our spine gets curved too far out, we tend to kind of push our butt out behind us. And this is a problem because it causes a lot of pressure on the hips and it causes uh, the rest of our body to get out of alignment. So in many of the stances in yoga, uh, for example, a standing pose even, uh, Tadasana, and a number of the warrior poses, I mean basically all of them, one of the major uh, corrections, the adjustments that we should all make is basically, and we can do this anytime, you can probably do it right now, is to, if your butt is kind of getting pushed out, to sort of rotate the hips down so that your spine is uh, only gently curving out at the bottom of the spine. There should be a slight curve that's natural and healthy, but we tend to really overemphasize it. Or sometimes uh, we hunch over, when we start to hunch over, this creates a big arch all the way through our back and we start to kind of push the bottom of our spine in the wrong direction. I personally have had many problems with that. So whenever I do a lot of the forward folds, I have to definitely try really hard to try to get my back straight and up and uh, the natural limits of my hip flexibility in my hips can definitely cause difficulties in a lot of those positions. But I'm working on it one day at a time. It gets better all the time. So that's one of the major things to worry about. Just uh, generally speaking, in a day-to-day -day actions, we can tuck our hips and that will be beneficial for us. Another one is this sort of this uh, hunchback type of maneuver where we kind of get our head down and forward and it causes a uh, hunch in the back of our spine. So uh, one way we can sort of work against that or work back towards a healthy posture at uh, most times is to you take, take kind of take your hands and go from thumb down to thumb in, all the way to thumb out actually. And this kind of opens up the chest. It's really about this twisting in of the elbows. What that does is kind of inhale, you kind of extend your, your back back and then exhale, let your ribs kind of come back into place. And then without moving your shoulders, here we are in a very uh, healthy, with the, there should, again, there should be a slight curve of, of the back of the spine. You know, the neck goes in from the back, right here it goes in, and then we have the kind of the hump of our back that does supposed to go out a little bit, and then you get to the bottom of our spine that curves down again, and then the bottom back round. So we have like a multiple S curve in our back, and that's healthy and correct. So that's, in a nutshell, what we talked about uh, without going into too much detail. If you do have back problems, knee problems, joint problems, then I would highly recommend looking into someone, getting a teacher, asking some specific questions as to what positions, what postures, asanas you can use to specifically confront the, uh, the issues that you might be having with your posture, your back, your pains and aches. We all have a unique wear and tear on our body. But one thing that's common, because we all tend to sit in chairs and we like to sit at tables, and when we sit at tables, we tend to put our arms on the table, and when we do that, it starts to put weight on the shoulders, and we start to kind of get all these hunched up. 
Mm -hmm. One thing we can do is basically stop leaning on tables is a very helpful way to fix posture most of the time. Generally speaking, if you put your hands in your lap or even on kind of an armrest and sit on your sit bones, that's going to go bring you kind of up and straight. And if you can sit like that more often, you're going to be healthier, happier, probably you're going to feel better because this sort of uh, space taking posture is one that promotes uh, well-being. We talked about power postures previously and this kind of all goes together. So that's most of that. Now, let's talk about yoga in general and there's so many different styles of yoga. When I was in Thailand, uh, I took an intensive, uh, intensive yoga class for about one week uh, in the north of Thailand in Nong Khai, a class that really sort of piqued my interest in getting more deeply into yoga. I remember the first day was like, wow, this is tough. Seven, eight hours, I thought, how am I possibly going to do this? I almost dropped out, and the guy that was in the course, he, uh, Mark, uh, got Mark from Germany, I, he said, no, Jeremy, you can't do it. you got to stick in it. And uh, he talked me into it, so I, I stayed in it. Day two was also pretty tough, but day three to seven, I started to get into the flow and realized, hey, wait a minute. I don't know why I was so worried about not being able to do this. Of course I can do this. I don't know why I was trying to get out and kind of put me in touch with that little ego part of my mind a little bit more closely and realizing that, hey, I kind of need this discipline to really uh, cultivate well-being in my life to, a, to the next level. And that sort of piqued me to come to this class here. And it is in that class, I asked, you know, what kind of yoga is this? And he said, oh, this isn't a brand name yoga, this is just good old fashioned yoga for enlightenment. And so what he meant to say is, in, another, in other words, that this isn't Ashtanga yoga or Hatha yoga or any specific type of yoga. This is a specific routine that he had developed over years and years and years, maybe decades of practice, and uh, a specific uh, culmination of the yogic philosophy. But most of us, if we're just getting into yoga, they're going to hear all sorts of terms and phrases that aren't going to really make sense unless we have been in the community for a minute. So real quick, I'd like to just make some distinguishing, uh, some distinctions between some of the different types of yoga. So generally speaking, Hatha yoga is probably the easiest place to start for most people. If anyone who's feeling, thinking to myself, man, I am not flexible. I, I kind of want to do yoga, but I don't have the flexibility. I don't have the strength to get into that. That looks like it's going to break me. Well, <laughs> that's a funny little way to talk to ourselves. So many people have told me that. I'd like to do yoga, but I'm just not flexible. And the answer to that is we don't do yoga because we are flexible. We do yoga so that we can become flexible, right? So obviously people who are already naturally flexible, they will have an affinity towards yoga. They'll join up and they'll feel like, oh, wait a minute, you know, I'm already... I'm already good at this, so maybe I can enjoy it more easily. While uh, those of us, and especially those us guys with tight hips and tight hamstrings from the Western world who have played a lot of sports and swimming and running and jumping and basketball and football or whatever it is, we got tight hamstrings and the first day we go to a yoga class and we think, what the heck is this? I don't know how I can possibly uh, keep up with this class. And you look around and everyone's twisting and reaching and it looks so nice, but you're sitting there going, Ugh, and you can't even get... Instead of everyone else got their hands straight up, and meanwhile, a lot of us are reaching over to the side trying to get through it, and it's a little bit discouraging at first, right? Well, if you're in that boat, first off, don't be discouraged. The point uh, of going to yoga is so that we can get to the healthy stretching parts, uh, positions that everyone else is in, and also, only, <laughs> if you remember, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, there's 195 Yoga Sutras, and only three of them pertain to the asanas. That means in a yoga practice, a complete yoga practice, the physical postures are only about one and a half percent of the entire uh, practice, which that's not entirely accurate, but it is a good orientation towards the, a, pra a full practice of yoga, meaning that it's not really about getting into the gymnastic positions that what counts. What counts is coming back to the mat day after day and using that as an opportunity for self-awareness, for growth, for uh, bringing your mind to the present moment and encouraging focus, concentration, and self-awareness. And especially becoming aware of that voice that tends to distract us, otherwise known as the ego, that running self-narrative that kind of can always go, that always interrupts us when we're trying to meditate, this kind of voice here. So it's not all about the postures. But that being said, considering what does the different types of yoga mean? 
uh, to the postures, as in, if I go to, what's the difference between a vinyasa yoga and a hatha yoga and ashtanga yoga and a iyengar yoga, you know, what are all these things, They're all these names that don't make sense to me, so what are the differences? Well, the first place to start, as mentioned before, is hatha yoga. Hatha yoga tends to be a number of set positions that you hold for a count, five to ten breaths, it depends. And you go into one position, and then you might stop for a moment. Depending on the intensity of the class, a lot of times the Hatha yoga classes will take frequent breaks between poses. Um, some of the more intense classes still will take some breaks throughout the class, and you go from one pose, kind of stop, go to another pose, sort of stop, go to another pose, and it's about moving from one to the other, uh, but just kind of going to those poses. All right, that's Hatha yoga. When you do Hatha yoga in a very hot room, hot yoga, that's when we get Bikram yoga. And that's not entirely true, but Bikram yoga, I think, has 26 postures. Uh, it's a set sequence, and it was invented by, uh, it was designed by a guy named Bikram, designed for hot rooms at, uh, you know, astonishingly hot, like 40 plus degrees Celsius, uh, 40, 45, like over 100 degrees. And it is basically Hatha yoga plus heat and doing uh, a specific sequence of those hot yoga, of the Hatha yoga, same 26 postures in a hot room. In a regular Hatha practice, you might, you're not likely to do the same postures every day. You'll probably do similar things, address all the different parts of the body, but you may have um, more intense focuses on back bends one day, one more day, one more, uh, a little bit more intensely on hip opening uh, exercises. And you'll always do kind of all of them, but you'll sometimes focus on one more than the other. So Hatha is the postures, Bikram is like those postures in a hot room, but a specifically 26 of those postures, always the same sequence. And then we'll move on to uh, Iyengar yoga. Iyengar yoga is probably the absolute safest type of yoga to start. If you are having any sort of severe body problems, and it started like I have a bad back, I had a terrible accident, and I have a slipped disc. Uh, my, I blew out my knee, I tore my ACL, my shoulders don't work, whatever your situation is. Iyengar yoga is basically the most rejuvenative, the safest yoga. Uh, what do I mean? In a lot of yoga, there'll be some props. You know, for example, you might have yoga blocks, uh, maybe a strap or two. In Iyengar yoga, it is comprehensive with the props that are being used. That is, if you're laying on the ground and the and for this posture, you need to flat, get your back flat on the ground. But for some reason, your back just doesn't do that. Your back is curved to the point where you can't get your back flat on the ground. Well, then they will find enough pillows, mats, or blankets to fill in that space so that your back is 100% supported on the ground. If you're doing a twisting pose and you can't get there, uh, you can't get all the way around, then you need to. You will be asked to not overstretch your current your current place. If you can only go this far, that's as far as you need to sh as far as you should go. And that's generally true with most of the yoga. But Bikram, uh, I'm sorry, Iyengar yoga in particular, is the most comprehensive with its use of props. So that um, using like bands to hold onto your foot. Sometimes there's uh, bands connected to the walls. So you can do downward dog, and that can help pull your hips up and different heights. Uh, bands for help help you with the um, inverted po postures, a number of other things, pillows, bolsters, mats, and all the fixings to make sure that every time you go into a position, you are in the absolute 100% perfect alignment of that position as far as your capability is at that moment. So that's probably the safest place to start for anybody who's very tight. One potential criticism of uh, the style of yoga is that it is almost, uh, it can be too soft for a lot of people. Some people are going, you know, and it's an hour and a half class, and in, a, in an Iyengar class, it's, it's likely that you won't even really sweat that much because you'll go from one posture, maybe you might do this, that same posture three or four times in a row, uh, you might do, you know, eight, 10, 12 postures in a day, but uh, variations of, this, of one posture again and again, but basically, it's not gonna be as exceptionally difficult, it's not gonna be a workout, that is, if you're looking for a, a workout, something that's going to make you sweat, and you're going to leave the room feeling like, wow, well, you know what, I, I feel like whew, I actually got like a good, you know, burn some calories in that session, I feel stronger, I feel more flexible. You will feel more flexible with Iyengar, but you won't feel like, you probably won't feel like you've had uh, an intense workout. At least that is my, has been my experience when I went, I went to Iyengar. And when I lived in Bangkok, that was a, a studio, an Iyengar studio that I was recommended, and I took, uh, 
quite a few classes at the, there, but um, yeah, it's just after I finished class, I felt like I still needed to, if I wanted to feel like I had done, you know, exercise for the day, I still felt like I needed to go for a run or do some strength training in addition to that. So that is one potential criticism. Iyengar is a, kind of like Hatha in the sense that you are doing, going from posture and then kind of getting out of it and then going back into the posture and then going out of it. And, and they're not really connected. Iyengar yoga also doesn't recommend until you get quite a ways into it to not to worry about the breath. Um, whereas as we get to the next one, you'll find that that's, uh, breath plays a much more prominent role in the movements. And so the next type of yoga we'll talk about is vinyasa. Vinyasa is basically flowing, right? Every t so when you see uh, a yoga routine and all of the postures are connected with specific movements that are coordinated with the breath, then that is vinyasa. And there are, vinyasa yoga can be applied to many different styles of yoga. Um, vinyasa in itself is not one of the main sort of branches of yoga. It is just a style that can be applied to yoga. So you can do a quite intensive vinyasa exercise routine, such as ashtanga. Ashtanga is vinyasa, is an intense form of vinyasa yoga. Or you could do actually a quite uh, lighter form of vinyasa. For example, when I took the intensive course in uh, northern Thailand a couple of a year and a half ago, then that was a vinyasa routine, but generally speaking, that was quite, though it was an hour and a half long routine, the postures were not as physically demanding as what an ashtanga routine might be, for example. So you can have any, many kinds of vinyasa. Vinyasa basically means flow. If you're in a vinyasa class, a lot of times you'll see um, for example, yoga in America, it will say vinyasa class. That's a flow yoga. Sometimes it, vinyasa is called power yoga because basically you're going to have strength training. It's going to not really strength training, but you're going to be doing a lot of like, for example, in a push-up plank position, inhale, push through the shoulders, exhale, lower down slowly, inhale, move up to upward dog, and exhale, move into downward dog. So that's a, a simple flow routine that's actually part of sun salutations that's uh, included in a number of yoga routines. And so this brings us to uh, Ashtanga Yoga. Ashtanga Yoga is specifically the type of yoga I'm practicing here. And of the different types of yoga, I would easily argue that uh, Ashtanga Yoga is one of the most physically demanding. I would not recommend people who are, have not been involved with yoga before, I would not recommend that they start with Ashtanga Yoga. The <laughs> The primary series, right, there's, there's basically four uh, sequences of, of Ashtanga yoga practices, four series. The primary series, primary denotes its first, and theoretically you might think, oh, well, primary is usually a word I associate with easy. I would not, however, mistake uh, primary in this sense for easy. It's actually quite physically demanding. Um, if you do the routine perfectly, if you can do the primary series perfectly, uh, which very few people really can, then you are a strong person because this is going to include uh, a number of things where, you know, where if you go into a push-up plank position, going to downward dog, for example, let's say we're going to go from downward dog, which is where we have, you know, both our hands on the floor, both our feet on the floor, and we're kind of in that uh, inverted V shape, right, the classic yoga position. Well. We're, let's say we're going to go from that position to a seated forward fold, so where we're sitting on our butt, legs straight, and reaching our hands towards our heels. Well, in order to move, make this transition from downward dog to the seated position, what we're supposed to do in a, in a perfect Ashtanga series is to, as we move, uh, jump our legs up and elevate the legs, and so then we have our hands down, bring the legs through, it's called a jump through, where you jump up and swing your legs through your arms without touching the ground, and then lightly whoop, set yourself, don't keep your legs up, and hold yourself there, and then lightly place yourself on the ground. So obviously that's a quite acrobatic move for a primary series, and basically the, la uh, the last third of the routine, ha between half and a third of the Ashtanga series, of the primary series, is done on the ground. And between each of these, uh, between each of the asanas, you do a, a vinyasa, you do a flow through uh, a little series from push-up plank to going through, down to downward dog, and then you're going to be jumping through. And 
really in a perfect world, you're going to have to, in a perfect Ashtanga series, you're going to do some hand balances, and when you get into those hand balances, you're going to have your hands on the ground, and for example, jump your legs uh, around your elbows and catch yourself in a little uh, wrapped around handstand, hand balancing position while on the ground. So, Ashtanga yoga is physically demanding, and this is the primary series. Included also in the primary series are some postures where if you do them perfectly, you're to put your feet behind your head while you're doing hand balances, uh, possibly doing handstands during the routine, ending the routine with headstands. That's pretty common to a lot of different styles. The point is that Ashtanga is a physically demanding form of uh, yoga, and so it's not a best place to start. However, it is a great strength training yoga, and if you really get into the philosophy of yoga and see how it can be applied to other parts of your life, then Ashtanga is actually, it's one of the most comprehensive uh, approaches to yoga because Ashtanga, I'm pretty sure uh, Ash, A-S, means eight and uh, Ash, uh, it means eight and Anga means limbs. So here we're talking about the eight limbs of yoga, but you'll find the eight limbs of yoga in you know, any number of practices. If you buy, if you pick up a big uh, BK, uh, A-S, Iyengar book and look through it, you're going to find yoga philosophy, including the eight branches of yoga. So it's not like the eight, eight limbs of yoga are exclusive to Ashtanga yoga, but Ashtanga does mean eight limbs, so its name encourages a full awareness of a yoga practice, including not just what you do inside the yoga studio. Right? So one criticism of Ashtanga yoga that is significant to, to consider for anyone who's trying to get really deep into this practice is that in Ashtanga yoga, because we're doing a lot of jump throughs, it's, it is physically demanding, we're doing handstands, we're doing jump throughs, we're doing back bends, we're doing knee bends, getting up in the lotus position, getting a, <laughs> folding your legs into a lotus position, which basically is where you put both legs up on your, uh, on your calves, and then uh, one of the positions is to reach through your legs and then bring your hands back to your head. So you have your knees basically up against your shoulders while they're still crossed, and your hands through, and then you're balancing, sitting on the ground, on your butt, sitting up right here. Uh, you know, this is tough on the knees. Uh, it can be for those of us who are not flexible. So if you, if you can't even get into the lotus position, then that position, of course, is going to be very difficult. I'm in that category. I can get into a lotus position, but I cannot, once I'm in that position, bring my knees to my chest. I'm not nearly that flexible in my lower back. So not to discourage you from trying it because there are for all the difficult positions there are, are alternative postures that can help you get along there um, and enough with enough diligent practice I think everyone can really uh, get through that primary series with effectiveness and efficiency uh, it's just important to note that because it is difficult because it is physically demanding and uh, basically a very strenuous form of exercise that it is possible to damage joints wrists uh, shoulders knees if you don't approach the practice with awareness and care. This is a practice where if you try to go over the top, ego is not going to help you. Ego is going to get you injured and that's going to slow your progress like we talked about a couple days ago. So those, that's the basic of uh, most, of the, um, most of the yoga practices. Just real quick, if we talk about Mysore Ashtanga yoga, Mysore style yoga, basically Mysore style means Ashtanga yoga, which is the same uh, primary, secondary, third and sequences. But in the Mysore style, um, no one is leading the class. That is, in Ashtanga yoga, generally speaking, there'll be someone indicating what's the next posture to move to. In Mysore style, all of the practitioners are expected to have memorized the basic routine, and they will go through that routine on their own in the studio. So that means everybody in the room may be on a different pose at a different time and there are going to be instructors in the studio who are going around who will be helping each individual adjust their posture but nobody's speaking it's a completely silent room for example all you hear is the ujjayi breathing breath which is a so that's that's my source style so it's a it's a variation of ashtanga yoga in particular it means you're practicing on your own there's in, instructors who are helping you adjust but no one's uh, not everyone's doing the workout together ashtanga is a specific flow series Iyengar uh, yoga is a type of Hatha yoga, but it has really emphasis on props and doing the correct postures. It's very safe. It's very, uh, very tuned in to making sure that you're doing the perfect version of each posture. Hatha yoga is uh, perhaps maybe like the maybe what we might think of as the uh, the base baseline of yoga. This is like 
if, if you're looking to get a very uh, an essential series, an essential practice of yoga, Hatha yoga is a good place to start. It's a good, it can be difficult, but you can get into it, the different postures, there's variations for each one. They're not going to ask you to do anything too physically demanding. They're going to find you alternative postures if something's too difficult for you, and you should be well supported. And then lastly, vinyasa yoga is any type of flow yoga. In America, a lot of the classes, especially power yoga classes, are a style of vinyasa yoga. Vinyasa means flow, that basically means coordinating the movements with the breath, as in breathe in, extend, breathe out, lower down, breathe in, look up, breathe out, look down, kind of sort of uh, coordinated movements. That's the vinyasa. Ashtanga is a type of vinyasa, uh, but they are not the same thing. Ashtanga is a very specific type of vinyasa. So. That is a yoga style overview, just like kind of an orienting view about what means what in the yoga world. And that is what we got for today. So if you've been enjoying these videos, go ahead and click subscribe below so you can be updated with the rest of these. And in the meantime, keep learning, keep growing, and have a great day.